Hi everybody, it's Dan. I'm here with a video that's kind of a follow-up to my last openings video about the Italian game. In this video, we're looking at the Evans Gambit, which comes about in the Italian game after e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, bishop c4, bishop c5, and the gambit line is b4. Now before we get into the lines we're going to look at today, I want to pause here and talk about why this is such an intriguing line for white. In the Italian game, white is going for a strong pawn center, but in order to truly achieve that goal, white needs just one more move. Playing b4 here sacrifices a pawn in order to make black waste a turn moving the bishop to b4, and then retreating the bishop to a safe square after c3. Meanwhile, white is able to make a couple of pawn moves that strengthen its center, and in other words, as with all gambit lines, the sacrifice of material is justified by rapid development and sharp possibilities. After b4 is played, black has a decision, accept or decline the gambit. Generally, the gambit is accepted, as otherwise black just loses a tempo and white still is able to form a strong pawn center. We'll go over more specifically what that looks like later. For now, we're going to have black accept the gambit. White immediately follows up with pawn to c3, and black here has another decision, where to place the bishop. There are three squares the bishop usually falls back to, and we'll look at all three of them. They are a5, c5, and e7. Just really quickly, bishop to d6 is not recommended because it blocks the d-pawn from moving, which not only traps flight square bishop, but also prevents the d-pawn from engaging in the center. We'll take a look first at bishop to e7, but before we do, I just want to mention what black has as kind of a general goal in the Evans Gambit opening. As with most gambits, black's best bet is to return the material safely and quickly, and also to play for a closed position, since this will dampen any attacking possibilities white might have. Another theme we'll see come up in several variations and lines is that of knight a5. In some instances, that knight will be attacking just a bishop that's sitting on c4, while in other lines, it'll be forking the queen and the bishop. Many times, it's a strong move, while other times, it gets black into a bit of hot water, and we'll see more specifically what that looks like soon. Bishop b7 is one of the older variations, and for a long time was considered very reliable for black. Even today, the move can lead to a solid position. There are two options for white here, an immediate d4 push in the center, or queen to b3. Queen to b3 can be an attractive move, especially because if black plays the very tempting knight a5 to fork the queen and the bishop, white can reply with bishop captures on f7 check, and black loses castling for the rest of the game. After king to f8, queen a4, and if black sticks the king's head out to capture the bishop, not only is, black, is the king risking exposure, but the queen gets the material back right away. However, the problem with the queen to b3 line is that here, black does not have to play knight to a5. Instead, knight h6 can be played, and now f7 is defended. Here, d4 is the only move, pushing into the center and allowing for queenside development, but in this position, knight a5 is now strong, since the f7 tactic is no longer available. And so after the knight exchanges the silf off for the bishop, black is in a rather safe position. Generally in gambit lines, you want to attack as much as you can if you're the side playing the gambit, but here white has lost one of its developed attacking pieces, and so it's going to have a bit harder time coming up with an attack, especially since, remember, white is down a pawn in all these variations. From here, play can continue with d captures e. White snips the knight and in the process inflicts a bit of structural damage. After the recapture, d6 allows for the bishop to come out, both sides castle, white completes development, but after c6, even though black's king is exposed, they still have a solid position. They're up a pawn with the bishop pair against the knight pair. So backing up to this position right here after the bishop originally falls back to e7, here the other option for white is to immediately push d4. Here black should play knight a5 to pick off the bishop, but uh, this gives back the pawn in the process. Um, after we have the knight recapture, black definitely needs to start chipping away at least a little bit of white center, and so they play d5. You have d captures e, the queen recaptures, and knight plays to d3 with an attack on the queen. Generally here, queen to a5 is good. After castling, you have knight f6, uh, c4 from white, and black castles, and black has a slight positional advantage here, probably again because they still have the bishop here. Um, alternatively, if after the knight attack on the queen right here, after the knight plays to d3, uh, queen to d6 is more passive, and allows white to get the advantage. After castling, knight f6, c4, uh, black castles, white can trade off the dark square bishops and then play knight to c3, and even being down a pawn uh, is compensated by white's presence in the center. So that's bishop b7, a solid option for black. 
The second option we're going to look at is going to be bishop to a5. This is generally considered a more flexible line for black to play, and in most variations black will be able to equalize with correct play. After bishop e5, d4 establishes another pawn in the center. Here black has two options, e captures d and d6. d6 is going for somewhat of a more closed position, whereas ed goes for material at the cost of development, a trade-off you always have to be careful when making, especially since a pawn move isn't really doing anything to mobilize black's pieces. If ed is played, white here should castle, and black really needs to resist taking on c3, and instead play a developing move like knight on g to e7. Uh, otherwise, taking the pawn here on c3 allows for white to develop the rest of its pieces, and in the end position that we get to right here, white is fully developed and has just excellent uh, piece placement and coordination. Black is still lagging quite uh, badly in development. So that's why if we back up to this position right here, after white castles, uh, black definitely needs to resist taking the pawn, um, and then instead should just focus on its own development. After this, we can have c captures d, black gets in d5, the position starts to open up, and after the bishops are deployed, this position is more or less equal. So going back here to this position right here, after d4, the other option for black is to play d6, which again is going for a closed position, and it's also allowing for the light square bishop to come out. White here plays queen to b3, which is getting two attackers on f7. Note that this move is definitely playable here simply because the bishop is on a5, and so the knight can't go there to fork the queen and the bishop for white. Here, black can defend with queen to d7. White exchanges the pawns in the center, and then the castle. Black here moves the bishop to b6, where it's putting pressure on the f2 pawn. White moves the rook onto an open file, attacking the queen, and the queen sidesteps to e7. Here, white has a tricky little move, pawn to a4. Black has to be very careful how to respond here. It might be really tempting to move knight to a5, forking the bishop and the queen, uh, but this is actually a blunder that is going to end up costing black a lot of material. After knight a5, if you'd like to pause the video, try to find the best continuation for white, but the move here that white should play is simply bishop captures on f7 check. If black uh, doesn't take the bishop and simply moves the king to f8, white just retreats the queen to a2 and has gotten the pawn back and has an extremely active position. Alternatively, if here uh, black does take the bishop with the queen, then white is able to unleash a world of hurt on black, starting with rook to d8 check. If the king takes the rook, then uh, the queen is hanging, so obviously that's not going to happen. The only other square that the black king can move to is e7, but after a bishop to g5 check, you kind of get the idea. I'm not going to go much farther down this line, uh, but this is generally just not going to end well for black. So, in other words, in this position right here, after a4, knight to a5, don't do it. Instead, a6 can be played, and after a5, black keeps the bishop on a bit more of an active square by putting it on c5. Real quick, taking the pawn here for black leads to a significant advantage. It doesn't matter which piece takes, uh, the same thing happens. I'll just show you what happens if the knight takes. Um, basically, what we're going to have is this position right here where black has gotten two pieces, two developed pieces, I'm sorry, white has gotten two developed pieces for black. Um, the queen here is eyeing c7 and e5. Uh, white has a lead in development and a safe king. Generally, this is just a very successful opening for white. There's one more main line for black to look at, and that is in this position if the bishop retreats to c5. Uh, one thing I do want to point out before moving forward is how this position can be reached with a slight change in the moves. For example, if black here captures the gambit pawn with the knight, uh, white here should just push c3, and once the knight retreats, the position is the same as if the bishop had taken and retreated to c5. And again, we'll look at that in a second. Uh, one thing that you absolutely do not want to do with white in this position is play knight captures on e5. If you'd like, pause and see if you can find the knockout punch for black here. Uh, but it is simply queen to f6. There's a mate threat, the knight is unprotected, and it's pinned to the rook. So this is basically game over. Uh, that's one little trick that white should be aware of. Uh, if the knight captures here, uh, just push c3 and be prepared to get into the line that we're about to look at. In this position here, white pushes d4. Black takes, and white castles. Black here needs to resist getting greedy for material and play d6. As in lines that we've already looked at, playing d captures c here neglects development and is costly for black. Just one example, white here can play bishop captures on f7 check, and after the recapture we have queen to d5 check. This gets the bishop back and the pawn. 
Um, so instead, generally just in this position right here, uh, black should continue with the development with the main line of d6. White here is going to capture, black retreats the bishop to b6, we have knight c3, bishop g4, bishop b5, and maybe best for black here is king f8 to get out of the pin. Otherwise, bringing the bishop back in this position to break the pin is just a waste of time since the bishop already went to g4, and then on the very next move to d7. Uh, so after the king side steps to f8, both sides continue with development. You have bishop to e3, knight e7, a4, a5. The bishop here comes back to c4 uh, with a threat. Just to show you what that is real quick, if black makes a nothing move like the bishop retreating, then we can have bishop captures f7, followed by knight g5. And so to sidestep that after the bishop plays here to c4, black should play the bishop back to h5. And after rook to c1, white maintains the initiative out of the opening. Now, I know this video is already pretty long, but there were just two more lines I wanted to touch on very briefly. These are lines that generally are not recommended for black, but if you're playing white, I just want to show what can happen and how white can take advantage of black's mistakes. The first line we're going to look at is the declined line. Generally, this is not recommended since black wastes the tempo and white maintains material equality. If black does decline the gambit, though, with bishop back to b6, white here can play a4, trying to trap the bishop, a6 is pretty much forced, and then you have knight to c3. If black here plays pawn to d6, white jumps the knight into d5, the bishop backs up, white plays d3, uh, black here can play h6 to prevent g5, as otherwise just to show you what happens if the knight develops right away, we can have uh, the bishop coming out here, and then at the end of it, uh, the kingside pawn structure for black is going to be pretty smashed. Uh, so that's why going back to this position here, instead of developing the knight right away, it's important that black play h6. Here white plays bishop to e3 and the dark square bishops are coming off, leaving black with just one developed piece, whereas white has fantastic development. An alternative in the declined line is instead of in this position right here pushing pawn to d6, you can play the knight out to f6. Here white is still going to jump the knight into d5, you have takes takes, black pushes e4, you have another round of captures, uh, black here is going to check with the queen, and here white can simply sidestep to d1. Now, this is doing a couple of things. One, it's keeping the initiative, since moving the bishop in this position back to e2 would waste time and would be walking into a pin. Uh, two, it's important that the king move to the queen side, since with the advanced pawns on that side of the board, the a1 rook is going to have a fairly easy time getting active. If the king goes here to f1, the h1 rook is not so happy. And third is threatening winning the queen with rook to e1. From here, black plays uh, dc so that after the rook check, black can block with the bishop. And in this position, white is clearly dictating play and has the initiative. So that's the decline line. The final line to go through is the rarely played counter gambit to the Evans gambit. It's rarely played for a very simple reason. It's not the best move in the position as it allows white to maintain both the initiative and material equality. What that line looks like real quick is after the pawn push to b4, we have d5. Uh, here you can have e captures d, the knight can come down and capture on b4. You have castles, black develops knight f6, white captures on e5, uh, the knight on b captures on d5, white pushes d4 and the bishop retreats to d6. Black pins the knight, threatening to take on d5, so black responds with c6, and then you have knight to d2 from white, and again, as we can see, White has the initiative, and the material is equal. So that's the Evans Gambit. I've tried to make this video as complete and thorough as possible. I've also been playing it a lot in my online games, although usually when I play E4 I run into the Sicilian, which doesn't let me get in, into the Italian game or the Gambit. But when I do play it, I have a lot of fun, and I hope you all do too. Ratings are appreciated, comments are welcome. Be sure to check out the Grandmaster game on the Evans Gambit. I did something a little different for this one, so I hope you enjoy it. Take care, and I'll see you next time.